before you gave your life to Christ, you can still remember the incidents and events in your life. If you had a scar on some part of your body before you gave your life to Christ, the probability is that that scar was still there after you gave your life to Christ. But where did this change take place? Where did this transformation take place? If it did not take place in your mind or in your memories, if it did not take place in your body or on your skin, where did the transformation take place? Where did the renewal or the new life come to be? It came to be in your spirit. So despite the memories of your mind, despite the memories of your body, you are a new creation. You are a new creature. You never existed before on the planet of the earth. And you, you might not feel that way at the moment, but what I want to remind you tonight is that through the sacrifice of Jesus, you are a new you. You don't grow older in terms of uh, expiring. <laughs> Amen. If anybody being Christ is a new creation. You know, on Sunday I talked about how uh, Adam was the first Adam and Jesus was the last Adam. There is no Adam that is coming afterwards. The first Adam brought people into, into sin and the nature of sin and the nature of spiritual death. The, the last Adam brought people, that's Jesus Christ, brought people into life, into righteousness, and into the nature of God. And so when we say, Jesus, come into my life, I receive you into my life, change my life, I repent of my sins, I repent of my past, I repent of my old ways, and I want you to come into my life and make me a new person. We actually become new. Everything about your life is meant to take on a new story, a new history, a new future. Let me share a testimony with you. You know, uh, some of you who are not new to church may have heard me share this testimony many years in the past. But I remember that when I was going through my senior secondary school years, I was studying in the science class. Now, I don't know how I got into the science class, but I ended up into the science class, and it was a lot of struggle for me. You know, I passed from one year to the other, kind of struggling to make it through uh, secondary school. I wrote some entry exams to the university. I ended up writing about three entry exams before I got to the university. I ended up writing about four school leaving certificate examinations before I got to the university. In fact, when I got to the university, I had to combine more than one senior school leaving certificate exam results to kind of get the, the, the credits that I needed to get into university. But when I got into the university, I had a conversation with God. I said, God, nobody knows my story before I came here. Nobody knows how many exams I had to write to get into university. Nobody knows the struggles I had to go through to get into university. Now that I am here, give me a completely new story. Rewrite my story. Give me a new story. It's like I was asking God to make me born again where my academic story was concerned. And that's exactly what God did. In my first semester, in my university education, I had more A's than I had, you know, putting my four school living certificate exam results together. God completely turned my story around. Nobody cared whether or not I had four certificates. Nobody cared whether or not I had written three exams to get into school. But I graduated from that university with a second class, uh, uh, second class upper, uh, second class upper degree in honors. Glory to God. Why? Because God completely rewrote my story. God completely rewrote the future for me. And that is what he did where our lives were concerned. God gave us a completely new slate. He, he threw the old one away and he gave us a new one. Hallelujah. It's like getting a brand new car. Nobody has ridden it before. Nobody, I mean, they would go and make it for you in the factory and they would deliver it to you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And that is what the new creation is. The new creation has no past in God. The new creation has no past in Christ. All things are passed away. Behold, all things. Somebody say all things. That means, you know, your, your health is new. Your wealth is new. Your, your, your family is new. Your, your marriage is new. Everything that is in your life has the potential and the ability to reflect the life of God. 
And so you might be in that place where you are saying, my life doesn't look that way. I am facing challenges. I'm facing struggles. There are things that I'm going through. And one of the things that we want to see God do through these Friday services is to position you to maximize and to demonstrate the life of God that is in you. Hallelujah. God gave you a new lineage. God gave you a new history. God gave you a new story. God gave you a new life. God gave you new opportunities. He gave you a new you in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody say, I am new. I am new. Glory to God. I am new. I'm not the old man that friends knew. I'm not the old man that people thought I was, you know, from primary school or secondary school. A man of God was talking about how, you know, he had been involved with gun crimes and all those sorts of things. And when he gave his life to Christ, people were thinking, can this person really be saved? But that is the fantastic work of, of, of the redemptive work of Christ, of the power of the Holy Spirit that comes upon a sinner and transforms them into a saint. We don't become saints when we go to heaven. We don't become saints because people here judge that our lives were worthy of being saints. We become saints the moment we give our lives to Christ. Hallelujah. We become righteous. We become holy. We become godly the moment we give our lives to Christ. We take on that same nature that God has. Hallelujah. And when we were made new creations, look at what the Bible says in the next verse. These are the features of the new creation. This is what we have in God and from God. Look at it. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18. It says, but all things are from God. Who through Christ Jesus reconciled us to himself. He received us into favor. He brought us into harmony with himself. And gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. That by word and deed, we might aim to bring others into harmony with him. Hallelujah. You know, the, the verse 17 says, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Verse 18 now goes on to say, now all things are from God. The New King James Version says, all things are of God. When you look at the life of the new creation, when you look at your life, if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, and receive them into your life. When you look at your life, you're meant to look at every area of your life and see that all things are of God. You know, I, 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 I get to the workplace sometimes and some of my colleagues ask, how are you doing? I say, I am doing good and I am always doing good. I am always doing good because when I look at my life, all things are of God. All things, God is in control of my life. God is taking charge of my life. God is working things out for my good. So listen to me. It doesn't matter how things feel. It doesn't matter how things look in the natural. All things are working together for my good. So when somebody asks me, how are you doing? I'm doing good. And I'm always doing good because God is working things out for my good. Hallelujah. Somebody needs to say that with me. I'm doing good. I'm always doing good because God is working all things out for my good. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. Listen to me. Where the life of the new creation is concerned, it will always end in your good. It will always end for your good. It will always end in your favor because that is what he says. That through Jesus Christ, God reconciled us to himself, received us into his favor, and brought us into harmony with him. Hallelujah. With himself. Glory to God. You see, and so one of the things that we have received in our redemption is the redemption from the curse of sickness and disease. You know, sickness and disease is something that has troubled the world from the very beginning. It has troubled the world. You know, you look, as man fell, sickness and disease came into the world as a result of sin. And then people begin to die to sicknesses and diseases. People begin to die, you know, from, from, the, from those of old who lived long and long and long, hundreds of years. We begin to see man fall frail, the body of man fall frail to the elements of the world. We begin to see the body of man fall frail to sicknesses and diseases. You begin to see the body of man begin to die. The Bible says even though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Hallelujah. 
So we begin to see man fall to sicknesses and diseases. We begin to see man fall to things that are what people refer to today or the medical science refers to today as incurable diseases. You know, there was a time when they seemed to find a way around things. There was a time when they didn't know what was happening. But now, thank God that knowledge has increased. People are beginning to identify what's curable, what's not curable. But this is the reality of the believer, that if you are a new creation, you have been redeemed from the curse of sickness and disease. Let's, let's go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. It says, Christ purchased our freedom, redeeming us from the curse and the doom of the law and its condemnation by himself becoming a curse for us. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree or is crucified. It says, to the end that through their receiving Christ Jesus. Can you see that? That by receiving Christ Jesus, the blessing promised to Abraham might come upon the Gentiles so that we through faith, somebody say through faith, might all receive the realization of the promise of the Holy Spirit. So you see that, that you are redeemed. You are redeemed. You are redeemed from the curse. You are redeemed from the curse of the law. You are redeemed from the curse of sicknesses and diseases. You see, if you go with me, let's just go to the scriptures. Let's go to the scriptures. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Let's just go to the Old Testament for a moment. Let's go to Deuteronomy. And I want us to read from like verse 14. You know, in verse 14, 15, it was saying, don't turn to the left or to the right from the word of God. It says, if you obey, obey God's word and you obey God's voice, then none of these things will come upon you. You know, but it said, if you don't obey God's voice, then you begin to see the curse at work. Now, this is the curse of the law. These are the curses that Moses said to the children of Israel. If you do not obey the law of God, if you do not obey the command of God, then these curses will come upon you. And Moses began to outline curses. Curses on their finances. Curses on their family. Curses on the work of their hands. He began to outline curses in their relation to victory over enemies. He began to announce curses in the field, curses in the city. He said, wherever you are, a curse will come upon you. He said, you cannot escape this curse. Wherever you go, the curse will follow you. Wherever you find yourself, the curse will follow you. Now, this was the curse of the law. And the Bible says in Galatians 3.13 that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. If this curse could fall on you because something in your life had gone wrong, the Bible says Christ has now redeemed you from this curse of the law so that in Christ, this curse cannot come upon you. Hallelujah. In Christ Jesus, this curse cannot come upon you. It's the blessing of Abraham that comes upon you, the blessing that makes rich and adds no sorrow with it. Glory to God. But he talked about them being cursed. But look at this, look at this. He said to them in verse 18, Cursed shall be the fruit of your body, of your land, of the increase of your cattle, and the young of your sheep. He told them they will be cursed when they go out and when they come in. He says, Curses will come upon them and upon all the works of their hands. He says, look at verse 21. The Lord will make the pestilence cling to you until he has consumed you from the land into which you go to possess. He said that they would, they said the Lord will smite you with consumption, with fever and inflammation, fiery heat, sword and drought, blasting and mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish. If you keep going, you know, there's one particular cause here that, I, you know, I keep declaring that it shall not influence me, it shall not affect me. Look at this. Look at verse 27. It says, the Lord will smite you with the boils of Egypt and the tumors, the scurvy and the itch from which you cannot be healed. It says madness, blindness, dismay of mind and heart. All right, talking about depression, talking about mental uh, ill health, all sorts of things. You say you shall grope at noon as the blind gropes in darkness. I mean, so many things. People, look at verse 30. Husbands, look at verse 30. This is a curse. He says you shall betroth a wife, but another shall lie with her. He says you shall build a house, but you will not live in it. You will plant a vineyard, but you will not gather its grapes. These are curses. These are curses. All right. But I, I want to go more to, to curses around health. Look at verse 35. It says, the Lord will smite you on the knees and on the legs with a sore boil that cannot be healed. 
from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. These are curses. These are curses about sickness and disease. Curses of sickness and disease. And the Bible says you are redeemed from the curse. You are redeemed from the curse. You are redeemed from the curse. Glory to God. I want to read some more to you. You know, like I said, there's a particular curse here that has to do with sickness and disease. And I want to look at it. Look at it. God has redeemed you from the curse. God has redeemed you from the curse. God has redeemed you from the curse. Look at it. Verse 60. Okay, let's read from verse 59. It says, Then the Lord will bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary strokes and blows, great plagues of long continuous. Can you see that? Great plagues of long continuous. If there's something affecting your health today, and he has stayed there for a long time. The Bible says a curse is a sickness or disease or a plague of long continuance. You know, when they talk about incurable diseases, incurable sicknesses, things that have to stay there for a long time before they go, it is a curse of the law. It says, and grievous sicknesses of long duration. Can you see that in Deuteronomy 28 verse 59? That is a curse. Look at verse 60. It says, Moreover, he will bring upon you all the diseases of Egypt, of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. He says, Also every sickness and every affliction, which is not written in this book of the law, the Lord will bring upon you until you are destroyed. He says, And you shall be left few in number, whereas you had been like the stars of the heavens for multitude, because you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now, he was not saying that God is the one who would put these sicknesses and diseases on them, but that by not obeying the voice of God, they will open the door for the devil to come and attack them and afflict them with these sicknesses and diseases. Are you listening to me? You know, we see in James chapter 1 that God does not do evil. He does not tempt with evil. Neither can he be tempted with evil. Every good and perfect gift comes from above from the Father of light in whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. So God does not tempt with evil, neither can he be tempted with evil. And he gives good gifts, glory to God. But through their disobedience, they will open the door for the serpent to bite. And we see that, that it happened to them. When they disobeyed God, serpents came into the tents of Israel and began to bite people and they began to die. And Moses cried out to God and the brazen serpent was put up, which represents, again, the sacrificial work of Christ. And anyone who looked at him was healed. You know, this is the interesting thing. The, the snakes didn't go away, but anyone who looked at the bronze serpent was healed. Sicknesses and diseases are in this world. But even though we are in this world, we are not of this world. Even though there are sicknesses and diseases in this world, and some of them may even be counted to be natural occurrences, we are not in, of this world. Listen to me. The natural occurrences, the natural sicknesses and diseases, the flus of winter, the hay, the hay fevers of winter, they do not have to be a part and parcel of your life. When people are talking about allergies, you do not need to claim or own these allergies. You can reject them in the name of Jesus. You can reject them by the sacrificial work of Jesus. I will never forget this story that Andrew Womack shared. He was talking, was, they were on a journey, on a coach. They were going somewhere, you know, as a ministry, and they had some of their partners with them. And there was this young lady that sat with him, and she was sharing with him how she has an, a nut allergy. And in fact, if there was not on the bus, she would be able to smell it. And then, you know, she would almost die. If she came there, she would die. And just on that bus journey, he shared with her the word of God concerning her redemption in Christ from sicknesses and diseases. And the, the coach stopped for them to ease themselves and for them to have a break from the journey. And this lady went into the supermarket. She bought a nut bar. You know those but those um, bars, those cereal bars, not bar, and she consumed the whole thing. Now, Andrew Womack did not even know that she, was, she went away to do this. But having heard the word of God, she believed that she was redeemed from sickness and diseases. She believed that she was redeemed from the not allergy. She went, she, she had so much faith, she went into the store, bought a not bar, and she consumed the whole thing and nothing happened to her therefore afterwards. Hallelujah. And she said to him on, on the coach, she said, you know what? 
I went in, I bought this nut bar, I've eaten it, and nothing has happened to me. I am completely healed from my nut allergy. Listen to me. It's that simple. It is that simple. It is that simple. If there is any infirmity, if there is any sickness, if there is anything wrong on your body right now, you can believe in the finished work of Christ where your redemption from sickness and disease is concerned and you can decide right now that you will no longer be sick, you will no longer fall under the power of this disease, that those symptoms will leave your body once and for all and that you will be free from that infirmity in the mighty name of Jesus. I stand in faith with you for the receipt of your healing right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You don't have to be bound by sicknesses and disease for a long time. You don't have to be bound by infirmities in your body for a long time. You can stand in faith and refuse to be sick. In the face of the symptoms, in the face of the pain, you can refuse to accept that as your testimony. You can refuse to accept that as your story. You can refuse to accept that as your life because you are redeemed from the curse. I want to encourage you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 28 and read about the curse because you are redeemed from the curse. The curse, you know, Deuteronomy 28 is full of sicknesses and diseases. But it doesn't matter what they are, you are redeemed. Even before Jesus died on the cross, he saw that old woman who was bent over. You know, I see people bent over every once in a while in the United Kingdom. But there was a woman who was bent over and she met Jesus. And it was a Sabbath day. She didn't even ask to be healed. She didn't even know that she could be healed. Hallelujah. You know, on the Sabbath day, Jesus just healed people for free. Hallelujah. He healed them for free. For free. They did not do anything to be healed on the Sabbath day. They didn't do anything to be healed. And just like this woman who was bent over, he said, ought not this daughter of Abraham, who has been bound low these 17 years, I believe it's 17 years, be loose from her infirmity? And he spoke to her, and she stood up straight, just like that. Bam! One time, stood up straight, stood up straight. There was a blind man, you know, he, he wasn't able to see from when he was young. Jesus met him, prayed for him, put something on his eyes, told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. The man went, he washed, and he began to see. This man did not even have an opportunity to engage Jesus to tell any story about how he wants to be healed or not be healed. It wasn't like blind Bartimaeus that was shouting, I want to receive, you know, I want the Son of God to have mercy on me. And when Jesus came and received a blank check for anything he desired, he asked that he may see. Another story is again in the book of John. That was John 9. Another story is in the book of John 6. There was this man who was just on the mat waiting for the waters to be stirred by an angel so that he could go in and be healed. And Jesus just got there and just said to him, pick up your mat and walk. Those were Sabbath days where they didn't even ask Jesus to be healed. But bam, they were healed of their infirmities. That man had been there 38 years waiting for the stirring so that he could go in. But in one moment... He received this healing. Some of you, under the sound of my voice, in one moment, you are going to receive your healing. That pain is going to disappear. That infirmity is going to disappear. That struggle that you've had in your body is going to go. That struggle that you've had in your mind is going to go. That pain that has troubled you is going to leave you in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 with me. We are redeemed. We are redeemed. We are redeemed from the curse of sickness and disease. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He personally, he didn't send an angel. He didn't send uh, Michael or Gabriel. He personally bore our sins in his own body on the tree as on an altar and offered himself on it that we might die Cease to exist to sin. Somebody say, I am dead to sin. All right? I am dead to sin. Romans 6 says we are dead to sin. Glory to God. It says that we might die or cease to exist to sin and live to righteousness. 
by his wounds you have been healed. Hallelujah. You have been healed. Somebody needs to hear that. Somebody's spirit needs to catch a hold of that. Somebody's mind needs to just catch a hold of that. I know you've heard it many times, but there's something about having an encounter with God. There's something about having an encounter with his word that just transforms your life, that turns your life around, that brings the miraculous to bear in your situation, in your circumstance, right here, right now, as you're under the sound of my voice, wherever you are watching from, he says you have been healed. Hallelujah. You are not trying to get healed. You are not going to get healed. Jesus is not going to heal you in the future. The Bible says by his stripes, by whose stripes you were healed, by whose stripes you have been healed, by whose stripes his past tense, you have been healed. Hallelujah. Some of us are saying, God, when are you going to heal me? God, you're not waiting for God to heal you. By his stripes you were healed. Hallelujah. By his stripes you have been healed. Hallelujah. You are not waiting for God to do anything. Some of us, we prayed, prayed in our understanding, prayed in tongues. Hey, Rabbi Shatta, we confessed. Ah, we tried this and tried that. After a while, you got tired and you said, God, when are you going to heal me? God, when are you going to heal me? And maybe that's the problem. All this time you've been praying in your understanding, praying in tongues. All this time you've been confessing. All this time you've been breaking bread. You have been waiting for God to heal you. But what you need to do is receive your healing. Hallelujah. God has already healed you. God has already healed you. You have to keep saying to yourself, God has already healed me. I receive my healing. I receive my healing. You know, think about what he said in 1 Peter 2.24. He talked about the fact that our sins have been washed away by the sacrificial work of Christ. We are not asking God, when are you going to save me? When are you going to save me? God, when are you going to save me? When we receive Jesus into our lives, we know that now we are saved. Listen to me. When you receive Jesus into your life, now you are healed. And I love the way he puts those two things together. If you can accept that you have been saved from your sins, you must accept that you have been saved from sickness and disease. If you can accept that you have been saved from your ungodliness or unrighteousness, you must accept that you have been saved from sicknesses and diseases of long continuance. You must accept that you have been healed of that pain. You must accept that you have been healed of that infirmity. And no spirit can hold you bound where you know that you are free in Christ Jesus. No devil, no demonic power can hold you bound when you know that you are free in Christ Jesus. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Whom the Son makes free is free indeed. And you shall know the truth and you shall practice the truth and the truth shall make you free. There are some of you under the sound of my voice who are still bound to sickness and disease, but as you hear these words right now, you are made free in the name of Jesus. You walk in the freedom that God has already given you. You walk in the freedom that Christ has already paid for you. You walk in the freedom by the power of the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible says in Romans 8, 11, if the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you, that same spirit will quicken to life your mortal body. If the Holy Ghost could quicken the dead body of Jesus and bring it to life and make it immortal, then that same spirit that is in you can quicken to life your knees, can quicken to life your elbow, can quicken to life your hands, can quicken to life your organs, he can quicken to life your feet, he can quicken to life your skin, he can quicken to life your hair, he can quicken to life your eyes, he can quicken to life your teeth, he can quicken to life anything that needs to be quickened tonight. Hallelujah! The same spirit. Why? Because when Christ died on the cross, when he said in John 19, it is finished, when they recorded those words, it is finished, when he uttered it to everyone who was on Golgotha, when he altered it on Calvary's tree, it is finished. He was saying, I paid the price for sin. I paid the price for sickness and disease. I paid the price for poverty. Hallelujah. 
So how do we receive this healing? How do we get this healing? Number one, you need to know God's promise to you about healing that is revealed in his word. You need to know what God has said to you about healing. I've shared some scriptures with you tonight. I'm going to just mention a few more scriptures. What has he said to you about healing? What is God's promise to you? The Bible says concerning Abraham, that Abraham was fully persuaded. Oh, that's the next thing. That's number two. Number one is know God's promise to you about healing revealed in his word. God said in Isaiah 55, 11, he says, my word that goes forth will not return to me void. If God has promised healing to you, that healing word, that healing promise will not return to him void. So number one, know the promise. Know the promise. What scripture are you standing on? You know, we talk about the fact that God's word is final authority for us. So there must be a scripture that you are standing on. What scripture are you standing on? You, you hear people who are battling sickness and disease and they say, I just know God is going to heal me. I just know God is going to heal me. How do you know that God, I just know, I just know, I just know. There needs to be a promise you are standing on. Some of us have not seen the healing that we think we should see or we think we believe we're expecting because we don't have any scripture we're standing on. We are making presumption on our assumption that God is going to make an execution. But the thing is that there is no word for God to honor where your assumption or presumption on his execution is concerned. You know, so you need to have a revelation of his word for you to see an execution of that word. You need to have a revelation to see an execution. You need to have a revelation to see a manifestation. You need to have a revelation to see a demonstration. Glory to God. I hope I'm not confusing you tonight, but there must be a revelation of the promise of God to you where your divine health and healing and life is concerned. You see, there are even levels. I just talked about the levels. There's divine healing where symptoms come and you are healed. There's divine health where you do not even experience things happening to you. You are just operating in that realm of being well. Hallelujah. And there is the realm of operating in divine life where the life of God is flowing so much through you. It's flowing into the others. It's transforming others. It's bringing healing and health to others. Hallelujah. Healing, health, life, divine healing, divine health, divine life. You must seek to progress along these lines. Don't be that person whose hope is in the medicine in his cupboard. Don't be that person whose hope is in the GP. Don't be that person whose hope is in an injection that they're going to receive. No, your hope should be in God. They that, they that put their trust in horses. They that put their trust in chariots. They that put their trust in men. They that put their trust in swords. They end up being ashamed. But anyone who puts their trust in God shall never be put to shame. Anyone who waits on the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles. They will walk and not grow weary. They will run and will not faint. Do not put your trust or your hope in men or in the systems of men. You may need those things as you progress in your journey of faith and you, and you progress in your journey from healing to health to life, right? But do not put your hope in those things. Put your hope in God. So number one, know God's promises to you where healing and health is concerned as revealed in his word because the revelation is what will lead to execution, is what will lead to manifestation, is what will lead to demonstration. Hallelujah. Number two, once you have found those promises, meditate on the promises of God until you become fully persuaded. Meditate. What does it mean to meditate? It means to consider it. It means to ponder it. It means to ruminate on it, to keep bringing it up in your mind, to think about it over and over again. You know, one way of meditating is just picking one scripture. Like that First Peter 2.24 I talked about, by whose stripes I was healed, by whose stripes I was healed. And for one hour, you're just saying, by whose stripes I was healed, by whose stripes I've been healed. I remember many, many years ago, I was a student, I was studying, it was my exam time, and I was unwell. I just went to the, to the uh, place of study. I couldn't study. I went out to the corridor, found a place to sit, and I was just declaring it. By his stripes, I have been healed. 
by his stripes I have been healed. By his stripes I was in here. That's what meditating is. That's why God said to them in the old covenant, he says, put it on your doorpost, put it on your belt, put it on your wall, put it everywhere. Everywhere you go, I want you to keep seeing my promises. Everywhere you go, I want you to keep seeing my word. That is what it means to meditate. You put it everywhere. Some of us think that we are standing on the word or we are meditating on the word and it's been a long time since we've even thought about it. Let the word of God be the stronghold in your mind. Cast down every other thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, against the knowledge of divine healing. There are some things in your life that are causing unbelief in your life. There are some of us who believe that you need to be careful. You need to be wise. You need to be sensible. You need to be this. You need to be that. All those you need to be in your life. You need to get them out of your life because they are the unbelief that is hindering you from experiencing divine healing. That's the unbelief hindering you from experiencing divine health. I have gone all in where divine health is concerned. Hallelujah. All in. All in. All in. I don't depend on, on any pills. I don't depend on any drugs. I don't depend on any liquid. I don't depend on anything. Glory to God. I don't live a careless life. I'm not, you know, I'm not careless about what I eat or drink or what I do. But I don't have a cupboard that has something for every event or every situation or circumstance where sickness or disease is concerned. I get God's word and I begin to meditate on God's word. I get healing scriptures and I begin to heal, listen to healing scriptures. I get healing scriptures and I begin to confess healing scriptures. That is how I overcome the pain. That is how I overcome the symptoms. I get back into God's word and I fill my mind with God's word. I don't allow the symptom to fill my mind. I don't allow the pain to fill my mind. Every time I feel pain, I will fill more, my mind with more of the word. Every time I feel discomfort, I will spend more time on the word because I want my mind to be full of the word. I want my hope to be clear that the healing power of God will be manifest in my body just as he did in the body of Jesus when he was risen from the dead. Number three, confess the word concerning healing. Number one, find the word so that it can be revealed to you. Number two, meditate on that word until you become fully persuaded like Abraham became fully persuaded that God was able to do what he had promised. Abraham got to a place in his life where Abraham, it didn't matter what you said to Abraham. He said, Abraham, you are a fool. Look at how old you are. You still think God is going to give you a child of promise. The Bible says Abraham did not move. Abraham did not move. Hey, some people from tonight, you are not going to move. When you hear things contrary to your health, you are not going to move. Listen to me, you might have to take some pills here or there. You might have to go for a surgery or an operation here or there. But you are standing on God's word and believing God for your complete healing. And you come to a place where you no longer need the pills, where you no longer need the surgeries, where you receive your healing 100% by faith. Hallelujah. So number three, confess the word concerning your healing. If, if, you are, if you have symptoms on your body right now, you have some pain in your body, there's some discomfort, there's a sickness or a disease in your body, an infirmity that is troubling your body, first and foremost, I pray that you will be healed right now. I speak from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. Receive a healing and a cure right now in the name of Jesus. And for those of you who are already on the mend, I pray for you right now. Be made whole. In the name of Jesus, whatever has been lost from your body, I pray that it will be restored to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Whatever opportunities that doctors or GPs may have said you have lost or that you may be losing, I pray that it is restored to you right now in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. So confess that word. Keep saying it. Keep saying it. it despite what your eyes can see. Despite what the doctor is saying to you, keep confessing that promise. Keep confessing that promise. Keep declaring that promise. Say it so much that in your sleep you are saying it. You know, this week I've been saying my confessions like I normally do on the way to the train station. I have confessions on health. I have confession on marriage, confession on my kids, confession on ministry, you know, confession on all sorts of things, finances, success in life. I keep saying my confession. And I notice that when I get to some confessions, you know, they have said it for so long. It is a part and parcel of me. You know, sometimes I'm saying after myself. I'm hearing myself saying it, and then I'm repeating after myself. And then I get to some places and where we are saying it together. Emmanuel 1 
and Emmanuel are saying it together. We are saying it together. Why? Because I've said it and said it and said it and said it. It has become a part of me. That confession has become a part of me. And I just keep saying, and I just keep saying, and I just keep saying, glory to God. And then if you keep saying, and you keep saying, and you keep saying, you are going to see what you say. Number four, I want you to act. Oh, and one thing I want to say about confession is that when you are standing in faith for your healing, don't say what you don't want to see. Don't say the opposite of what you want to see. Don't say, oh, I don't know why I've woken up with this pain again. You know, sometimes you are going to bed and you say, by the time I wake up, this pain will be gone. And you wake up and the pain is still there. You wake up in the morning and you say, thank you, Father, because this pain is gone. Thank you, Father, because I am healed. Thank you, Father, because my body is restored. Thank you, Father, because my body is fully functioning. Thank you, Father, because my body operates the way designed for it to operate. You keep thanking God. Hallelujah. But let's go to number four. Number four is that you act on the word of God and as led by the Spirit of God. What promise are you standing on? You know, you can't say you are healed and you are behaving like somebody who is sick. You can't say you are healed and you are behaving like somebody who is under the bondage of that infirmity. You can't say that you are healed and you are behaving like somebody who is trapped. You have to act under the influence of the word of God that you are standing on. So there are things that the Holy Spirit will ask you to do. There are things that the Holy Ghost will ask you to say. You are meant to respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Romans 8, 14, that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Hallelujah. So as the Holy Ghost leads you, you are meant to follow the leading of the Spirit. So you need to ask yourself, God, is there something you want me to do? Is there a wisdom you are revealing to me where my health is concerned? Because there's something that you are meant to do. There's an action that you are meant to take, a corresponding action. In James chapter 2, James said, show me your faith by your words, and I will show you my faith by my actions. A, press, a sign that you are in faith, a sign that you are in faith, a sign that you believe is that you will act. James said, even the demons believe and tremble. He says, don't you know, O man, that faith without works is dead? Didn't you see our father Abraham, that by works his faith was established and he was called righteous? So then faith being alone is dead, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith being alone is dead. But when your faith is backed up by your actions, then you see execution. Then you see demonstration. Then you see manifestation. It's so important for you to act in faith based on the words that you have received. If you are having a headache and you believe God has healed you from that headache, then get up and begin to do things. Go and clean up the house. Go and wash the dishes. Go and make some food in the kitchen. Go and take a shower. Put on some clothes. You might be feeling that pain, but do it as you're feeling the pain. I don't know how Abraham felt when he went to sleep with Sarah so that she could get pregnant and they could have Isaac. I don't know if Abraham felt all that good. I don't know if Abraham felt all that strong. But the Bible says that Abraham went there and Abraham slept with his wife. The Bible says Sarah by faith received strength to conceive. The Bible says they were exercising their faith. They were doing the things they needed to do to experience manifestation. When you look at Hebrews 11, you see people who exercise their faith. They are not just in the scriptures because they are popular people in the Bible. They are in the scriptures in the Hebrews 11 because they did something. They did something. They did something. So for you to receive your healing, you must do something. I'm sharing with you the steps to receive your healing. Number one, know God's promise to you about healing as revealed in the word. Number two, meditate on that word until you become fully persuaded. Number three, confess that word concerning your healing. Keep saying you are healed. Number four, act on the word of God as led and as led by the Spirit. Corresponding action is your faith in action. Corresponding action is your faith in action. How do I know you are in faith? Because I can see you moving. How do I know you are in faith? Because I can hear what you are saying. How do I know you are in faith? Because I can hear, I can see how you are acting. And then finally, number five, give thanks for your healing. Give thanks for your healing. Even though you are still seeing the symptoms, 
Even though it looks like nothing has changed, give thanks. Father, I just thank you because I'm healed. Father, I thank you because the healing power of God is at work in me and my body is whole. I can do what I couldn't do before. I could go where I couldn't go before. I could see what I couldn't see before. Just keep declaring your thanksgiving. Keep giving thanks. Keep giving thanks. Keep giving thanks. Keep giving thanks. thanks. Hallelujah. The Bible says in all things, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, I believe it is, in all things give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you. We just keep thanking God and rejoicing and rejoicing and rejoicing. Philippians 4, 6 says, be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and uh, petition with thanksgiving, let your, okay, let's look at 1 Thessalonians, maybe 4, 4, 5, 14. It's in that 1 Thessalonians 5, where it says, uh, in all things give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. You know, and then in Philippians 4, 6, it says, look, just don't be anxious for anything, but pray to God, make your petition known to God, and then it says, do it with thanksgiving, hallelujah. Do it with thanksgiving. It's like when you have told God what it is that you want God to do in your life, because you know that God has heard you, because you know that God has already done it, what do you do? You give thanks to God. In the face of the symptoms, you give thanks. In the face of the lack, you give thanks. The Bible says they wanted to feed 5,000. They brought the boys lunch, five loaves and two fishes. He lifted it up to God and he said, thank you. He got to the tomb of Lazarus. He lifted his voice and he said, Father, I thank you because you always hear me. Hallelujah. We have thanksgiving because we are confident. The only reason you can give thanks is because you are confident in God. The only reason you can give thanks is because you are fully persuaded. Hallelujah. The only reason you can give thanks is because you know that God has heard you. You know that God has already done it. You know that it is already finished in the sacrificial work of Christ. It is finished. Listen to me. I can tell you about different sicknesses and diseases, symptoms that have come on my body, things that have come upon my children, attacks to their health or to their life, and how my wife and I have stood in faith, how I've stood in faith, how my wife has stood in faith at different times, where our lives are concerned well, different pastors and ministers have stood in faith, mistakes we've made in our work of faith, and how we have seen results when we have done the right things where our work of faith is concerned. I can tell you that you can have that feeling, you know, that when is God going to heal you because I've had that feeling before and then I've caught myself. I've caught myself. It is not when is God going to heal me. It's that I need to receive my healing. It is not when is God going to heal me. It is that, Emmanuel, receive your healing. Receive your healing. Even in the face of the symptoms, even in the face of the doctor's report, give thanks. Because you know that God has healed you already. Not that God is going to heal you. God has healed you already. I want to share some scriptures with you about healing. I mean, if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will see so many testimonies of healing. If you look at the Acts of the Apostles, you will see so many testimonies of healing. But I just want to share some scriptures with you about healing. The first one is from Exodus 23, verse 25 and 26. Exodus 23, 25, and 26. It says, you shall serve the Lord your God. He will bless your bread and water, and he will take sickness from your midst. None shall lose her young by miscarriage or be barren in the land. I will fulfill the number of your days. Listen to me, you are not going to die like a chicken. You are not just going to die a useless life. We are not just going to die like somebody that does not have destiny. No, it will not happen to you in the name of Jesus. Look at it. It says, he will take away sickness from the midst of you. There will be no miscarriage. There will be no barrenness. And he says, you will live a long life. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will fulfill the number of your days. When do you want to go? You know, I have people who say, when I'm 90, I'm ready to go. You know, I will just bless all my family members. I will lie down after my 90th birthday and I will say, bye-bye, guys. See you later. And I will go. <laughs> you know, the Bible says that Jesus gave up the ghost. You know that Jesus died. Jesus, <laughs> I can't say he killed himself, <laughs> but he gave up the ghost. Hallelujah. You know, when all things, the Bible says now when all things were fulfilled, he said he was finished and he gave up the ghost. He released his spirit. He released it. He said, nobody can take my life from me. I lay it down willingly. They didn't kill him. 
as it were. He gave up his life. He gave up his life. They can't kill you. They can't kill you. The devil can't kill you. The situation and the circumstances you are going through, the burdens of life you are going through cannot kill you. The only way that a believer can die is if they give up their life. I'm telling you that you are going to live a long life. I'm telling you that you are going to live a long and fulfilling life. Hallelujah. You are going to live to your hair is white, not even gray. Hallelujah. When you are satisfied, it says in Psalm 91, with long life it will satisfy you and show you his salvation. Glory to God. Let's go to another verse of scripture. Exodus 15 verse 26. You can see how excited I am about your healing, your health, and your life. Glory to God. Why? Because if any man be in Christ, is a new you. It's a new creation. It's a new creature. All things like sickness and disease have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Look at this. Exodus 15, 26. It says, saying, if you will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord your God and will do what is right in his sight and will listen to and obey his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I will put or permit none of these diseases upon you, which I brought or permitted upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. That is who God is in your life. He says, I am the Lord who heals you. 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 Glory to God. There's a song that I used to sing when I was much younger. I sang it a lot when I was much younger. It was, I believe it was it sung by John Moen. I don't know if he wrote the whole song, but the song says, I am the Lord that he let thee. I am the Lord, your healer. I sent my word and healed your disease. I am the Lord, your healer. And we say, you are the Lord that he let me. You are the Lord my healer you sent your word and healed my disease you are the lord my healer he is the lord that he let thee he is the lord your healer, he sent his word and healed your disease. He is the Lord, your healer. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I just sense such an anointing in the house tonight. And Father, I pray for that healing anointing to rest upon everyone under the sound of my voice. And I pray that every burden of sickness and disease, every yoke of infirmity is removed and destroyed right now in the name of Jesus. From the crown of your head to the sole of your feet, this anointing finds expression in you and destroys every sign and symptom of sickness and disease in your body in the name of Jesus. That is spirit of infirmity that has troubled you up to now, that has plagued you up to now, its power over your life is broken in the name of Jesus. Another verse of scripture is in Matthew 8, 17. It says, And thus he fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, he himself took in order to carry away. He himself took in order to carry away. Matthew 8, 17. He himself took in order to carry away our weaknesses, and infirmities and bore away our diseases. If Jesus took it away, if Jesus carried it away, then there is nothing that you need to carry any longer. There is nothing that you need to carry in your body any longer because Jesus took it away. If he took it away, you can't have it. You know, if I take these uh, earphones away, you, it can't be with you any longer. If he took it away, 
you can't have it any longer. So you can't say, I have this sickness or I have this disease. Because as somebody who is saved, Jesus took it away. You can't say you have it. You can't say, I have a headache. Jesus took it away. You can't say, I have a migraine. Jesus took it away. You can say, I'm healed from a migraine. I'm healed from this thing. I'm healed. Hallelujah. But you can't say you have it because Jesus took it away. You can't own something that has been taken away from you. You can't own something that has been taken away from the new creation. Taken away from the new creature that you are. Hallelujah. He took it away. Carried away our weaknesses. Carried away our infirmities. Bore away our diseases. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 3, verse 16, concerning the man that was healed at the gate called Beautiful. Acts 3, 16. The Bible says this, and his name. True and by faith in his name. What's that name? Jesus. Somebody just say with me, Jesus. Come on, somebody say, Jesus. Hallelujah. And his name, true and by faith in his name, has made this man whom you see and recognize well and strong. Whole and strong. Maybe you are under the sound of my voice tonight and you need to be whole and strong. Receive it in the name of Jesus. He said, yet the faith which is true and by him Jesus has given the man this perfect soundness of body before all of you. Glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> Jesus, 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 there is something about your name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance after the rain. Kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but there is something about your name. How I love calling your name every day. Your name is the same. How I love calling your name every day. Your name is the same. How I love calling your name every day. Your name is the same. There is so much power in that name. And at the mention of that name, every symptom, every sickness, every disease, whatever the name of that sickness or that disease may be, whether it's a name that has been carved out in the last 10 years or 100 years or a name that has run for 2,000 years, whether it's a name of a sickness or disease that is labeled or written in the scriptures or one that is post the writings of the New or the Old Testament, the Bible says at the mention of that name, Every, that name is higher than every other name. <laughs> it is not an ordinary name. It's a name that's full of power and praise. At the mention of that name, every other name, whether in heaven, on earth, or under the earth, should bow, hallelujah, and they will confess that Jesus is Lord. At the mention of that name, and so we speak the name of Jesus over every situation tonight. And I pray that everyone under the sound of my voice, whether you need a miracle in your body or you need a miracle in any area of your life, at the mention of that name, in the name of Jesus, receive that miracle tonight. Receive the salvation from that situation or that circumstance. In the name of Jesus. There's such an anointing here. Are there other scriptures that you stand on where healing is concerned? I wanted to just share it in the chat so that other people can see other scriptures that you have stood on in your own walk of faith, in your own life. Just write it in the chat. 
when other people come, they are going to see these scriptures. They are going to be encouraged by these scriptures. What are those scriptures that you have stood on? The Bible says in Psalm 23 verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Do you know that you shall not want for healing? You shall not want for health. You shall not want for life. Glory to God. I thought about Psalm 91. With long life, it will satisfy you. Glory to God. And show you his salvation. No sickness or disease can kill you because with long life, he will satisfy you and show you his salvation. Hallelujah. Look at 1 John 5, 4. That scripture applies to everything. Whatever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What scripture do you stand on? The Lord in the midst of us is mighty. Hallelujah. Ah, do not be afraid of them, my little children. First John 4, 4, for greater is he that is in you. He that is in the world, the sickness, the disease that is in the world. You don't need to be afraid of cancer. You don't need to be afraid of depression. You don't need to be afraid of arthritis. Say, I'm getting older. Arthritis is beginning to latch onto me. Don't, don't make that kind of confession about your life. You are free because Jesus has set you free. You are free because Jesus has made you free. Hallelujah. Come on, lift up your hands wherever you are and just give God thanks. Give him thanks for the word. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the word. We thank you because by your stripes we have been healed. We thank you because you took away our sicknesses, our diseases. You bore away our, our, our infirmities so that we no longer have them. Thank you because through your sacrificial work, we are redeemed from the curse of the law. Thank you because you have made us a new creation. You have made us a new creation. And so if you are watching this video tonight, you know, while others are giving thanks to God for the word that they've heard and giving thanks to God for their healing, maybe you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life. You have not received him into your life. I want you to say this prayer with me. Uh, in this moment, you can receive Jesus, and then you can become a new creation. You can become the new you. Your hopeless situation can become a hopeful situation. Your eternal damnation can become eternal life with God in heaven and forevermore. Say this with me. Say, dear Father God, I thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. I believe in my heart that Jesus died for my sins, and I believe that he rose from the dead for my salvation and my justification. And I receive him into my life. I repent of my sins. And I ask you now to receive me into your family. Thank you for in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Father, thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice. For those who have received you into their lives. I pray that their lives will not remain the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. I want to hear your testimonies. I want to hear about your healing breakthrough. I want to hear about the healing that you have received today. Hearing these words and being prayed for, whatever the situation or circumstance may be, you can even share your testimony in the chat of how the Lord has healed you. Praise the Lord forevermore. Testimonies are powerful. Uh, they are a sign that God is a witness, that God is moving a witness, that Jesus is alive. And I want to encourage you as believers to share your testimony. Like I said, throughout the month of March, we're going to be looking at the new you. What are those things that have changed in your life because you are in Christ? I want to encourage you to encourage others to be a part of these meetings. I want to encourage you to go and look at the uploads and listen to it again and again. I know that it will tremendously bless you and that your life will not remain the same again. Hallelujah. I want us to take some time to give, uh, and I want to share with you from Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. It's our Friday service, and I want to encourage you to bless uh, the Lord and the work of the ministry at Kingswood, London. The Bible says in, in Luke 6, 38, it says, Give, and gifts will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Will they pour into the pouch formed by the bosom of your robe, and used as a bag, all right? Today, it will fill your bag, it will fill your bank account, it will fill your investment account, whatever it is that you use as a store for money. The Bible says men will give into your bosom. 
For the measure you deal out, with the measure you use when you confer benefits to others or you give, it will be measured back to you. And so I want to encourage you to take from what you have and to give tonight. Uh, the media team are going to put up uh, the giving details so that you can see the details, whether you want to give uh, through uh, Barclays Bank or you want to give by PayPal or you want to give through any of the other means that are available. You can even go to our giving page, kingswellondon.org, and find lots of opportunities to give, including using a debit or credit card on our website. And so, Father, we thank you for tonight's service. We thank you for how you have helped us, how you have prepared us, how you have saved us, how you have brought us into a life of redemption from sickness and disease. And, Father, we pray that as we give tonight, that not only will the benefits of healing, of health, and of life be manifest in us, but every other benefit that we have received through the redemptive work that you've done will be manifest in our lives in the name of Jesus. Thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice. My prayer is that their lives will not remain the same. They will not just be hearers of the word, but they will be doers. They will apply these five steps to receive their healing in any situation or, or circumstance where they may be fighting